Good evening, I'm Norbert Williams, and welcome to Keeping It Real, the show where we discuss people and issues. Tonight, the Huonora International Airport Redevelopment. In early 1941, the United States Air Force's Southern Command, with a mission to defend St. Lucia against enemy attack during World War II, activated Bean Army Airfield in Viewfort. To be precise, it was activated on September the 28th, 1941, and hosted the 5th Bombardment Squadron, which flew B-18 Bolo bombers. These bombers flew anti-submarine patrols to sink marauding German U-boats which had wreaked havoc with Allied shipping in the region. In St. Lucia, the British Army established its base at the VG Barracks and the U.S. Air Force based at Bean Field in Viewfort, now Huonora International Airport. During the Second World War, Viewfort became a base for American troops. This was all part of the Battle of the Caribbean, which was a naval campaign waged during World War II and was part of the Battle of the Atlantic from 1941 to 1945, when German U-boats and Italian submarines attempted to disrupt the Allied supply of oil and other material. They sank shipping in the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico and attacked coastal targets in the Antilles. During the war, 445 ships of Allied nations were sunk in the Battle of the Caribbean and the Atlantic. St. Lucia was not spared in that battle. The Lady Nelson and the Umtata were torpedoed and sunk in Castries Harbor by a German submarine U-boat, the U-161, on the night of March the 10th 1942 with much loss of life. It was for that reason the British Army's South Caribbean forces were embodied to secure the islands and the vital sea lanes upon which the Allied war effort depended. With a third of all fuel used by the British in World War II coming from Trinidad, Venezuela and Aruba and with the Panama Canal being vital to the shipment of war material, the bases in St. Lucia were critical to the Allied victory in 1945. Therefore, the significant importance of Huonora Airport has been both military and civilian and continues to be of critical importance to the development of St. Lucia. In April 1971, the airport was renamed the Huonora International Airport. Since then, the airport's role in the economy of St. Lucia has grown by leaps and bounds. After independence in 1979, tourism became an even bigger part of the economy. And since the demise of the banana industry, now accounts for approximately 80% of the economy. It has been realized for quite some time now that the current terminal and airport facilities are woefully inadequate. 
overcrowding, especially on weekends, long lines to clear customs and immigration, passengers getting wet in the rain because no skyways sheltered them from the elements. These and many other complaints grew proportionately to St. Lucia's ever-increasing popularity as a tourist destination. For all intents and purposes, Uenora International Airport had outlived its usefulness, lagging behind other airports in the region. If St. Lucia's tourism industry is to move on to the next level, redevelopment of Uenora International Airport is a must. Now, as the United Workers' Party administration is on the verge of commencing the redevelopment of Huanora International Airport, we hear the opposition St. Lucia Labour Party argue that their method of effecting this redevelopment is a better option. Let's hear from Dr. Kenny Anthony in this 2014 interview. Something happened that made the situation different and it is the first time St. Lucia has experienced this. This time around, we could not borrow to finance the deficit. That is the crux of your problem. St. Lucia could have gone along its merry way for the next couple of years very easily if it could borrow money to pay for the deficit. It would have put us in more trouble down the road. Down the road, yes, later on. And, and certainly we would have collapsed, but we would have bought time but we can't now because, generally speaking, institutions in the region are unwilling to lend governments. And let me just ex give you an example of, of, of what I'm getting at. A lot of people have heard of something called bonds. And we normally finance um, the deficit or obtain money for development purposes by issuing bonds. These are really paper instruments that say to those who take those bonds, look, at the end, if you lend us... $10 million, at the end of 10 years, we're going to give you the $10 million back plus an annual um, interest rate of, let us say, 10% or 5%. So if you lend us um, <laughs> um, $100 million, then you get $10 million in, in profits or whatever the case might be. Are you with me? Yes. Now, last year, and this is where the crux of the problem is, we wanted to issue bonds of $266.5 million dollars. But we actually were able to raise only 45.5 million. That's a significant difference. In other words, we were not able to raise 221 million. Likewise, we wanted to raise short-term loans of 38.9 million, but we were only able to raise 29.3 million. Again, a shortfall of 9.6 million. So what has happened here is that we cannot turn to borrowing to fix up our deficit because banks, individuals, and institutions who used to lend before are no longer lending governments. They're insisting that they will lend you if you get your financial house in order. It is clear from that interview with Dr. Kenny Anthony in 2014 that St. Lucia's fiscal house was not in order. It is also clear that St. Lucia's creditworthiness was in serious doubt as stated by Dr. Kenny Anthony, since the bond market, as well as banking and international institutions, were unwilling to lend to St. Lucia or purchase its bonds. There is no other conclusion to be reached, but that under Dr. Kenny Anthony, St. Lucia's fiscal house was not in order. It is also clear that Huanora International Airport had outlived its usefulness and was under severe strain to keep up with the demands of increasing passenger numbers. With St. Lucia's economy predominantly based on tourism, it was not lost on either the SLP or the United Workers' Party that for our economy to grow, the impediments of Huanora International Airport would have to be overcome. It was unambiguously clear the airport's capacity had to increase significantly. Basically, St. Lucia had only two options to finance the redevelopment of Huanora International Airport, either by a loan arrangement or via a lease option with a developer. For the St. Lucia Labour Party, 
the only option available to them at the time was via a lease arrangement. As a result, the St. Lucia Labour Party's defense of their choice is only to save face since attracting attention to their inability to raise funds would then be glaringly apparent as the reason why they chose the developer lease option rather than a loan arrangement and would put St. Lucia at a significantly disadvantaged position financially. Their option would have cost St. Lucia dearly over the course of 30 years. Prime Minister Alan Chastney explains. And the big difference between a concession and a loan is regardless how well you do, the concession stays for the 30 years and they con the concessionaire continues to benefit from the improvement. But if you have a loan and the numbers start doing better than you expected, it means you can pay the loan off faster. So to pay off a hundred million dollars, if the number of arrivals by the fifth year is in excess of 500,000, which we think more than likely it's going to be, we can pay off the loan in six and a half years. So it means it would have taken us 11 and a half years to pay off the loan. And that means that the full $35, which would be close to $22 million US a year, that that revenue now can be used to fund something else. So whether it's the North-South Highway, whether it's port developments, whether by that time you need to expand the terminal again, you have revenue. Whereas when you're giving the concessionaire the money, that concessionaire is the one who's going to make the determination as to how they're going to spend that money. And so we were able to show that if we in fact pay off the loan in 11 and a half years, so that means you would pay 20 years of the concession, right? At 60, U at 60 US dollars based on the numbers that you have. So you're talking about uh, something like 360 million or more US dollars you're giving to the concession that could have been used now for something else. And so we said, it's, it's, it's worth the risk of taking on the debt. Now remember, SLASPA is the one actually taking on the debt. All government did was provide a guarantee, right? So um, in our mind, it's not the same, right? But it's still counted towards our national, our overall national debt. But we felt that that was uh, a risk worth taking based on the benefit that we potentially can create. So we think that having the cash to do more things for the country and being in control of our own destiny based on our revenue stream versus um, being overly conservative on the debt to GDP and allowing another person to be able to have control of a significant amount of money. But you say a hundred million dollars, that's a hundred million US dollars. Yep. But the figure that has been put out there quite a bit is 400 million EC dollars. Correct. Where's the additional? So the 100 million US dollars is for the terminal. And then there is another 70 million US dollars, which will be for the runway resurfacing, because the runway needs resurfacing, building a taxiway. So for those are people who've gone in and out of the airport. The planes have to wait at a point because they have to go on the active runway all the way up to turn around. So if you put a parallel taxiway, it actually improves the efficiency of the airport significantly um, and also building a new air traffic control tower. So what is the intention to do is that we've already secured loans with local banks for the 70 million US. And so the five year of the monitorium where we'd be collecting the $35 but not only having, to, only having to pay back the interest, we can use that money now to pay back the loans that we're gonna take locally. So the loans will be paid for within five to six years. So it means that when you go into your fifth or sixth year, all you owe is the $100 million, and that's when you're starting to pay back that money at that point. So uh, it gives us the opportunity of using that monitoring period, using the existing cash for the, under the first five years to pay off that loan very, very quickly. And we've gotten some really good um, rates from the, the two major local banks to be able to proceed with, with, that, with, that, with, that in, with that investment. These are some very interesting facts. Stay tuned for more after the break. Independence, a nation's proudest moment. Nothing compares. 
It's a celebration of a proud history and four decades of outstanding achievements. St. Lucia, get involved. Support and patronize events taking place throughout the island for the 40th anniversary of our independence. We're all in. It's our journey, our future. Be proud. Be part of the celebration. We're all in. United Workers' Party government's method of redevelopment for Huonora International Airport is to guarantee a loan to SLASPA from the Taiwanese government. So let's break it down by the numbers. But let's agree on a simple fact that the redevelopment of Huonora International Airport will cost 400 to 450 million EC dollars, whether under the UWP or the SLP. So now, under the SLP, the operator would finance and develop the airport for 30 years, during which time it would recoup its expenses. And as remuneration, SLASPA is to receive annual concession fees expressed as a fixed percentage of gross revenues of the concessionaire. Further, the government of St. Lucia is to receive corporate income taxes from the private operator. This means that the revenues would be split between St. Lucia and the operator. Under the UWP government's plan, we know for a fact that the cost of redevelopment is EC 400 to 450 million dollars, just as under the SLP. The difference here is that the Taiwanese conditions are as follows. One, that there be a moratorium on payback for five years. That is a payback on the principal. However, the interest payments would commence during those five years. This allows the government to begin depositing the dev development tax from passengers in a lockbox account. Two, as I said before, only the interest payments will be paid during the first five years. Three, 400,000 passengers enter St. Lucia by air every year. Now let's do the math, folks. 400,000, multiply that by US $35 airport development charge. That equals, on a yearly basis, US $14 million. Stay with me now. US $14 million, we're going to convert that into EC and we're just going to use the middle of the road figure of 2.6. So that's $14 million multiplied by 2.6 equals EC $36 million every year. If arrivals remain at the current 400,000 passengers per year for the period of 30 years in this instance, the expected total collected revenue of the development tax would be EC $36 million multiplied by 30 years. That would give us a total of $1,080,000,000. That's right, folks, $1,080,000,000. Now, let's not forget that the departure tax has gone up from US $25 to US $73. That is an increase of US $38. What happened when the departure tax was increased um, for air passengers? Well, let me go back a little bit in terms of understanding what is it and the history of Hunor International Airport. So Hunar in Airport was actually originally built as a gift by the Canadians. Um, uh, and I think probably back then, nobody had really would have envisaged that St. Lucia's tourism was going to grow to the extent it has. I mean, and, and, and combined with the HIA was also um, the hotel, um, which was originally called Halcyon, Halcyon Days. Um, so that basically had the airport and you also had um, the, the airport in, in, in the south. So um, for many years, we've now already recognized that 
um, the airport really had reached its useful life, uh, both in terms of size and also in terms of structure. And it had gotten to the point where it was diminishing returns. The level of investment that you were going to make into the airport um, would not have increased its capacity significantly. So it wasn't just about improving the quality. And I remember when we were in government in, in 2006, um, and the, the intention was to fix the airport. We actually originally spent a lot of time deciding, first of all, that we were going to do George Charles Airport. And we attempted to see if we can get jets to arrive into George Charles, uh, specifically a 737 from Miami. And we actually worked with American Airlines um, for that. And when we came to the absolute conclusion that it was going to be impossible to do that, we then turned our attention to Hunor Airport. And so originally, given the height of both the arrivals area and the departure area, the, the, what we looked to do was to actually create a mezzanine floor to be able to expand the facilities from that, from that perspective. And then again, when we did the technical studies, the problem with HIA was that the terminal where it is actually located um, does not allow you to have wide body planes, so the 747s or the 777s, um, to park in front of the terminal because means that the tail of the airport actually would be too close to the runway. So it becomes what we call an impediment. Um, and that's why currently the wider body planes park off to um, the right or the left, whichever way you're, you're standing. Um, now, in doing that, it created more difficulties. So people who've gone to the airport would know that, you, that the passengers who are leaving um, are, are interfacing um, with passengers that are, that are arriving, which is a no-no in, 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 in the aviation business. Also, passengers are walking in front of the baggage area, which is also uh, a problem. You also have the fact that we can't put jetways in the air, and, and some people feel that we don't need jetways, and other people think that we do need jetways. But we certainly didn't have the option as it, it currently is. So you had, couldn't put wide bodies in front of the terminal, you're, you're in breaking um, uh, laws, IKO laws, um, by what you had. And we got away with it because it was, it's grandfathered in. So the decision then was to build a new terminal. Um, and we went through the process of designing a new terminal. We selected a company called Harry, um, which is out of Miami. And we were doing it in consultation with American Airlines. Um, so Mr. Peter DeLora was really very instrumental in giving his time and expertise. American had built 44 airports around the Caribbean and Latin America. So when we, we did that, the idea was to build the airport terminal in the car park. So phase one would have been building the terminal in the, in the car park. Phase two would have been the de demolition of the existing terminal. And then phase three would have been adding on the additional piece. Um, again, close to where the car park was. Uh, Unfortunately, that project did not get off the ground. So before we had left office, we actually imposed a $35 tax, and that $35 tax was specifically put in a lockbox um, to be able to raise funnies, monies to pay for the airport um, terminal. So that was in 2011? About 2000, uh, yeah, 2010, 2011, right? And it was a big debate, it was debated in the House, and um, people argued for it, against it, but the, the, the government passed the, 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 the act. And um, before we um, left office, we left almost $50 million in the lockbox um, towards that development. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, we at the time had put some impediments in terms of the loan. One, we did not want to have a government guarantee, and two, we were not prepared to pay higher than 6.5%. And so the negotiations with Deutsche Bank and everybody else really came to a grinding halt over those two, those two issues. Um, there was elections, we lost the government, the new government came in. So the new government spent some time figuring out what they were going to do with the airport. <coughs> Eventually they decided to bring in IFC, the International Finance Corporation. And the uh, IFC said, look, the only way that you can do this project without providing a government guarantee or without it um, being part of the government's debt is, is to create what we call an SPV a special purpose vehicle. Um, some people can make reference to it as a, a PPP. 
So basically what you would do is you would have to give up the operational uh, uh, accountability of the airport. So you, you assign the asset to uh, a company. The company would then become responsible for managing the airport, collecting all the revenues, um, and then uh, if they're making profits, they would pay it in form of a corporate tax. So in, so in essence, the reason for this is because of the government at the, day, at the time the financial situation, the, the financial house, which needed to be put in order according to what Dr. Kenny Anthony said regarding the finances of St. Lucia at that time. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the government felt that they, um, maybe they, think, they didn't think the airport was going to contribute enough to the GDP growth, and therefore they didn't want to increase the debt to GDP, um, and decided that allow it to be managed by somebody else um, and in doing so it would not be considered the debt. So w when they did that the IFC prepared a briefing paper for them which is the, a paper I read in, in the house. And it's an important paper it's about three or four pages long and the, the, the paper really basically says what is it that the concession would have to look like in order for private sector companies to be interested in bidding on the airport. So the bidding would be to be able to get a lease for 30 years um, and that they would be able to collect the taxes and that they would be then responsible for building a new terminal, right? Um, so the, the document said that basically um, that the, the tax that they would need would be a minimum of $55, right? Now remember we talked about we had increased it to 35 so uh, when we increased it to 35, it brought the tax to $60 in St. Lucia because $25 was still being collected by SLASPA and the 35 was going into a lockbox to pay for the airport. So what they were proposing is, is that the $25 that was currently being collected by SLASPA plus an additional $30 at minimum is what would be required and all of that money would now go to the concessionaire. And with that money, the concessionaire now would build a new airport um, and also would operate it. But all of the revenues would go to the concessionaire, including the duty-free revenues. And the government would now get um, some basic taxes. I think it was about $5 in like security charges and some handling fees. Um, the government would get the landing passenger. Per, per passenger would get the landing fees um, on, the, on the planes, um, but all the remaining money would go to the concessionaire and that the government then would get paid based on the profits. So whatever profits they were making, the operating profits, they would get it from a corporate perspective. Um, they said that in developing that, that they recognized that whatever investment that the company was going to make, it needed to at least get a 12 uh, 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 interest rate of 12 percent on its investment, 15 percent. Sorry, a re rate of return on its investment. So, uh, by the time that the government accepted those basic rules and they had started the bidding process and they had come down to three um, companies that were prepared to do the concession, those three companies all were saying the same thing: is that 55 dollars was not going to be enough. So the number was likely to be 60 to $65. Now we know that the former government went ahead and approved the 55. Okay, so they said that they gave the permission to the Minister of Infrastructure that once required um, that he would have the authority to go ahead and increase the tax to $55, right? And we now know in hindsight that they would have requested even more than the 55, probably $60. Okay. So when we came in as a government and we looked at what the situation was um, and we calculated how much the concession was going to be. So the concession for simple mathematics is $60 um, times uh, 400,000 because we get 400,000 arrivals. Right? So I think that comes to something like, if I'm not mistaken, 720 million US dollars. But that's over a 30 year period that they would get, the, six, the 720 million. But the 400,000 is not going to be the number of passengers over a 30 year period. The number of passengers are going to increase. So we, you know, we already have 2,000 rooms coming in, 
we have the possibility of a, a, a cruise ship home port, which it, at minimum is going to increase it by another 100,000, possibly 200,000. But even if we take, we take it as a minimum as 500,000 or 550,000 as an average over the 30 years, you're talking close to a billion US dollars the concessionaire would have accumulated in order to be able to pay for an airport that was 100 and 130 million, 140 million dollars. Even if you want to say 150 million dollars. So we felt as a government that that was way too much money to give to a concessionaire. Plus experience tells us that when a concessionaire gains that kind of money and has complete liberties to spend the money how they want to spend the money because that's the purpose of the concession in order for it not to be debt on you is that you have no control of managing the airport or any of the revenue that concessionaire can decide how they want to spend the money whether they want to have more consultants whether they want to increase the salaries they, whatever they want to do So what role would SLASPA have had under that? Only a regulatory So the airport would be operated um, by uh, this concessionaire, which I don't have any problems with. I mean, there's lots of airports around the world that are operated on, on, the, on, on, the, on the concession um, proposal. W our concern was is that uh, that seemed very expensive because you're committing to the 30 years. So regardless of how well the country does, the concessionaire was being really the primary beneficiary. So we said, okay, if we took on the debt, that yes, it's going to increase our debt to GDP. But at the same time, the airport allows the country to grow, and the country growing reduces your debt to GDP. So yes, the debt's going up, but if the GDP is also going up, then your debt to GDP ratio doesn't change. All right? And so the question becomes, um, in taking on that debt, how long may the, the two be out of balance? And the fact that we were at 63% debt to GDP, even if it moves the needle by 4%, um, we still think the country is better off um, by doing that. And, and the question becomes why? So the, the, when we were looking to increase by $35 to $60 way back when, um, the airport taxes in other countries were around $80. When we came back into office in 2016, many of those same countries, their airport taxes were $100 and more. So Antigua is $100, Jamaica as an example is $127. So we felt that we actually had space to increase the tax higher than the $35. So we made the decision to increase the tax from $25 add the 35 which would go to the uh, lockbox to pay for the airport and added an additional, if I'm not mistaken, $38 on top of that to get to $98, right? And the additional 38, so $25 would remain with SLASPA. Um, the additional $38 is being used to be able to uh, finance roads, to finance marketing and other things. So. In doing that, we then went to get funding. And we were trying to find a government that was willing to give us a loan in exchange that that government would build the airport. So Chinese, the Taiwanese, um, the EU, Canadians, a whole bunch of people offer those kind of scenarios. Um, and we finally came to a conclusive agreement with the Taiwanese. So the Taiwanese offered us a um, hundred million US dollar loan uh, at um, LIBOR plus one and a half, so that's LIBOR currently is around um, just just under two percent, and therefore you'd add one and a half, so we're about three and a half percent that we're paying on LIBOR, and LIBOR rate's been pretty sta stable, right? And w we get a, a twenty-year loan, of which with the five-year first years is a monitorium. So what that means, we only pay the interest rate for the first five years, and then after that we start paying back both the principal and also the, uh, the interest. This works out to be an additional EC, one billion, one hundred and eighty-five million, six hundred thousand dollars. Adding those two totals gives us a grand total of EC, 
two billion two hundred and sixty five million six hundred thousand EC dollars but what happens when the passenger totals go up to five hundred thousand or six hundred thousand what happens when it gets up to one million after all if we look at the 30-year period and with the ever-increasing percentages and record numbers for St. Lucia tourism, it's very easy to calculate, to estimate, to predict that passenger numbers will increase over the years. Certainly after 10 years, after 15 years, 20 years, what do you think? All of these monies will go directly to the government of St. Lucia to finance development on the island. St. Lucia is an iconic market. We have the Pitons, a world heritage site. We are the number one honeymoon destination in the world. And St. Lucia is a high-end tourist destination, not a budget stop. Around the Caribbean, departure taxes averaged US $100 or more with our main competitors like Jamaica, Antigua, the Puerto Rico, and the Dominican Republic. St. Lucia's departure tax then, a paltry U.S. $25. Contrary to the doom and gloom predicted by the opposition St. Lucia Labor Party, an increase in St. Lucia's departure tax did not result in lower passenger arrivals. In fact, after the departure tax had been increased by US $38 to US $73, passenger arrivals increased to record numbers. The past two years of record tourism arrivals in St. Lucia have belied the fears which have been peddled. If these past two years have been any indication of the direction of St. Lucia's tourism numbers, it only boosts and substantiates the United Workers' Party government's decision to go with the Slaspa loan option with the Taiwanese government. This looks like a win-win situation as the added revenues will go to major works on the much spoken about Northeast Highway, cruise ship ports and other infrastructural developments on the island. The influx of new hotels and the expansion of existing facilities are nothing less than confidence in the economy and projections of increasing demand for St. Lucia as a tourist destination. In addition to the airport terminal, the apron will also be enlarged and restructured. The old Huronoro was designed to accommodate five aircraft. With the redevelopment project, that number will increase and will be accessible via enclosed jet bridges. The apron area will include parking space for bigger jets, such as the Airbus 380, the largest passenger aircraft currently in service. Additional spaces will also be allocated for Boeing 747-400 and 777-200 wide-body aircraft. The old terminal will be used for charter aircraft, particularly those flying in passengers, who will board cruise ships 
at the soon-to-be-built cruise ship port in Viewfort. Huonora International Airport seems to be headed in the right direction. And the last thing I really want to explain is that um, the other benefit of what we're doing is we've identified a new location for the airport terminal. So instead of building the airport terminal behind the existing terminal, we've actually moved it to the bottom of the Kakabeth. So uh, parallel. Now that does a couple of things for us. One, that during the construction period and given how busy the airport is, it doesn't interfere with the daily operations. Two, that instead of having to demolish the old building, we now get to maintain the old building. And, and it already has a tarmac and it has uh, storage, uh, oil storage facilities and everything else. So the intention is to use that airport terminal for charters. So we are now very actively in negotiations with Carnival in order to build a home port, which will be based out of View Fort. So it means you have the possibility as many as 6,000 passengers coming in and going out. So 12,000 passengers transiting St. Lucia over a, a three-day period of passengers arriving on the day of. So what you can do is just use that facility um, in order to clear so it doesn't overly congest your existing airport terminal. It also means that should we ever get what's called pre-clearance facilities, meaning with the United States, that you would clear U.S. Customs and Immigration in St. Lucia, it gives us the ability of making that now a dedicated U.S. terminal. Because most of the planes that are going to come from the U.S. are not going to be wide-body planes. They're going to be 737s, maybe 757s, I doubt that, um, but really primarily 737s. So they can park in front of the turbo as they do now without a problem. So you can park as many as 68 U.S. planes around that terminal um, and making that a dedicated. So it gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility in being able to move, to, to be able to move forward. It is clear that St. Lucia needs the redevelopment of Huonora International Airport as soon as possible if this country is to leverage and benefit from its high demand in the tourism market. The direction of this government with the loan arrangement from the Taiwanese is the better of two options. Feel free to email us with your comments at info at keepingitreal.lc. Till next time, I'm Norbert Williams. Good night. One. Go back down and start over again. Oh, really? Come slap me there, you know. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to Keeping It Real. I'm Norbert Williams. Coming up right after the break. We're going to say right after the break. In tonight's show, the Huonora International Airport Redevelopment. Good evening, I'm Norbert Williams. Good night and welcome to Good Evening 1941 and hosted. Oh. which had wreaked havoc with Allied shipping world. The institution, you and our in international... Okay, let's just go back to that line. Go tiger again. For the life of the concession, of the concessionaire... Oh, what's the next part? We now, for a f we know for a fact... Oh, let's just do that a little bit. 400 passengers enter St. Lucia yearly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> The numbers will continue to rise. I had something. Major works on the. Well, well, well.